Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. and today I'm reviewing Sacred Valley from North Star Games. Sacred Valley is a 3-5 player crop planting game, an optimization game which players are trying to get as much money as possible through the successful planting and harvesting of crop and also managing their own player abilities. This is put out by Ice Mix and North Star Games and uh, let's go ahead and get into it. So like I said already, 3-5 player game and what you're going to be doing in this game is you're primarily planting crops. Every single turn in the game you're going to be doing one of four different things, all handily printed on your player board and honestly one of those things you should probably try to avoid doing most if not all of the game early game there's sometimes reasons to but either way let's go through the four basic actions four basic actions are plant harvest purchase and work work basically means that if you have no dollars at all if you have no money then your entire turn can be spent taking one dollar generally very efficient again early game there might be times too but most of the time you want to try to avoid that action probably why it's printed in red printed in red although that might be because you have a requirement of having no coins past that you're primarily planting harvesting and purchasing Purchasing, well, you know, let's go through the planting aspect first. When you plant in the game, what you're going to do is you're going to take a single tile, whatever crop you have, and you're going to plant that crop in the game. There you go, I planted it, it's a size one. I'm gonna go ahead and move my meeple up one on the harvest track. That's the basic idea of planting. Now on a future harvest turn, I can go ahead and harvest, moving my people from wherever they are down to the beginning and then taking how many coins they are there. So for example, right now I take three coins. If you were harvesting from five, you would take 11 coins. Now you know completely how to take the harvest action. The harvest action is effectively the culmination of the, of the multiple planting actions you've taken along the way and all the coins they've paid you. The complicated part is the planting action has a lot more to it. First of all, you can only plant a resource that you have the technology for, that you know how to do, you're proficient in. Now every player is going to start the game with their color crop, this is something that they can plant. So over here we can plant that, they can plant their peppers, whichever player, whatever, whatever color you are, you can plant that harvest, that good, but you have to buy technology cubes in order to plant the other types of crops. That's the first restriction you have. Second of all, just in case it wasn't clear from this, right now this is a size 1, if we had this over here and we planted this, that would be a size 2, and we'd immediately go straight to 2, and if you planted 3, you'd go up one, two, three, every time it grows larger and larger, you're going further and further in the row for each time you do a planting action. So that's going to be the elements of the planting action there. It's also worth noting this is a shared grid. All players are sharing that grid, which means as I go out and plant a crop, if another player has the same technology and a crop in that technology, they can go ahead and build off the things I've been building towards. So do I want to go ahead and start it off and I get one and you get two? Or do I want to wait till you start it off so that you get one and I get two? Or are we basically just both playing a game of chicken until eventually someone gives up and goes ahead and plants a crop. That's going to be the basic idea of the planting action. A few small other things to get into, but that's the core idea of it. The harvesting action we covered already, which brings us to the purchasing action. When you take a purchase action, you purchase as many things from the market as you can afford and uh, that you have space for, and those things are going to be crops over here. So you can buy crops for one, two, or three for those respective crops over there. You can buy vines for two. Vines are kind of similar to crops, but a size one, a size one vine will always bump you up two, but a size five vine will also bump you up two. So they kind of act as a static measure and they can be useful for blocking off access to other players having access to certain regions or crops or controlling the flow of the board. And then you can also go ahead and buy technology cubes the ability to plant other crops. You're going to start with one over here, but then past that you can pay two for your second, three for your third, and five for your fourth over here. You can never plant all five crops. You're never able to do so in the game. But you can go ahead and add more crops to your ability, giving you more agency or flexibility over what kinds of things you can go ahead and plant on the board. It's worth noting, you can only store three crops over here. These two spots are reserved for if you get the technology tile from these over here, that will let you do so. Speaking of which, talking about the, these over here, these are also going to be things you can buy paying the cost shown above it, paying an extra one if you buy those two. So for example, I can pay one, put this down here, and boom, now I can use all five of my technology spots, of my C tile spots, my warehouse spots, because that's what this warehouse keeper tile does. They also sometimes give you end game points. That's usually more common as you get the later ones. Right now we're looking at the age one ones, but there's age one, age two, and age three. They have ongoing abilities, they have costs, and they have end game points as well. And that's going to be what you do on a purchase term. You purchase technologies, of uh, tiles, you purchase uh, you know abilities and all that, and crops in the game. So that's the kind of arc you're taking. In the game, you're basically going to be taking arcs. Uh, you take it actions which are going to involve you uh, planting crops, which will give you more, which will allow you or your farmers to move up on the harvest track. You're going to be cashing in your farmers to get those coins. You're going to be using those coins to purchase more things so you can rinse and repeat the cycle faster and faster in the game. 
Now, when you want to unlock the second terrace over here, you can do so by forcing another player to share that cost with you. So the first terrace is going to cost you, you and one other person, one, and this one will cost you, you and one other person, two, which is a small little element of forcing someone who you think might be winning to share in that burden, but you also have to share in that burden. So it's a kind of catch a mechanic, but also not really. It's a it's an interesting little element there. I don't know how significantly it mattered. That will also have the effect of clearing out the markets when you do so, and that will unlock new terrain, and that brings us to the llamas over here. Uh, the llamas are on top of crops, those will give you plus one whenever you add a crop matching the field that a llama is in. So a size one becomes a size two, a size four becomes a size five, etc, etc, etc. That's the basic idea of the game. You're going to go through this until this entire board is completely filled with all the crops you can possibly imagine, everyone having placed their crops, and then finally the players will end with a single final harvest turn, which is a free harvest turn, you're guaranteed to be able to harvest, and you're going to see who has the most money across the course of the game, add in the few points from the technology tiles, and that's basically going to be how you play Sacred Valley. Which brings us to the review, starting off with ease of play. Rulebook's fairly straightforward. I would say that the game weight versus the rulebook rulebook might, be a, might have been a drop confusing, but it was fairly easy to get, get up and running of this. The, the biggest thing that's just struggle is trying to get a sense for how this plays out because you're operating on a shared board and the actions seem fairly straightforward, but there is a lot of agency and decisions as far as the actual tactics of what you're trying to do, which I guess is a good time to segue into what I like, starting off with uh, the tight decisions of how to optimize. The game is operating on a shared grid, and ultimately on your turn, you're going to start off very, very scarce. You're going to have nothing you can really do. You're just plant planting your singular starting plant tile, and boom, that's going to give you the ability. Your first two actions are going to be planting this over here, and then likely, you know, going, well, I guess you can have a few options because you do start with three money, but you're going to have in your first three turns, you're planting a single tile, you're going to cash back and take three more money, you're going to spend your money at the market and start setting yourself up. But the game will start off fairly slow, and as you start getting into that first third of the game, you're going to start finding ways where you can get more done, where you can start placing down a tile and moving up four in the harvest track. Then you cash in, and you get nine coins, and now you can suddenly spend those nine coins trying to get those extra tiles and undercutting the market from other players, taking the right abilities before they can take abilities from you. Because abilities will do anything from expanding your warehouse to giving you more coins when you harvest, to being able to block other players with your meeples, to be able to put little uh, llamas on the board. There's a lot of things the abilities will do and gives you a lot of agency over how to help your your own engine and how to get in the way of other opponents in the game. There are spots you can go ahead and claim with the meeple. There's spots where you can place the meeple down and it forces the other players to pay taxes to you every time they expand that field. There's a lot of abilities in these three rounds, one, two, and three rounds of abilities over here, and trying to find the right combination of actions, uh, the right sequence of do I plant, harvest, buy? Do I plant, plant, harvest, buy? Do I harvest, plant, buy? Like the, the way you're going to layer out your actions because every single thing you do is catered around the idea of how do I get the most back from this. You can have the most action efficiency by planting until you go all the way up to seven over there and then cashing back for 15 coins, sure. The problem is action efficiency like that is not the only thing that matters. Undercutting the market with other players, if you and another player are both going for peppers right now, right now for the cost of four, you can guarantee that you get both those peppers over there which can help you expand that giant pepper field so it might well be worth taking those actions. And knowing when and, when and where the math of an action is worth the payout is a big part of you playing Sacred Valley. There's lots of player interaction and meanness, both in terms of the way you're going to undercut the market, but also in the way you're going to undercut the board. Growing your own fields while trying to get in the way of other players' fields, of trying to figure out, well, you know, those two players are going for the pepper field over there, they're fighting over those peppers, well, I can slightly cut them off with a combination of my own field, plus a few vines on the other side, I can make so that the peppers no longer really grow across the course of this game, which is going to really limit their ability. There's lots of player interaction, awareness, and meanness in the game. There's also these ability tiles over here, which are going to give you a ton of ways to break break the game, not necessarily break the game, that might sound a little strong, to give you ways to try to circumvent what you can do, what others can do, and how to get in the way, and the variety of those ability tiles is going to give this game a little bit more longevity, because the basic map board, which we'll get to later, is a little bit more static, a little bit more uh, direct in terms of how much you can actually expand or develop, given the structure of how this is laid out. There's a good amount of game here for 60 minutes that forces you to play, that forces you to do as much as you possibly can with as little expenditure. Aspects of trying not to buy your fourth technology tile, because, hey, you don't have to plant all four crops and now you just save five coins so that's going to give you a lot more flexibility those types of small little things of figuring out not just what you should do but what you don't have to do and what you don't need to focus on is a big part of trying to optimize your way towards having the most money at the end of the game as far as things i don't like in the game first of all on the nitpick level of things uh, the ability tiles often have very small text sometimes it's a little more necessary so i understand it but other times it just feels like they are unnecessarily small as far as the uh the text on the tiles and the ease of reading them uh, in our games we have to have players just reading them out whenever 
reading the tiles out to other players whenever they came out, because otherwise you really, would, really wouldn't know what's going on with those tiles. I'll also say that I touched upon this already a little bit, but there are limited ways to play the central grid. The central grid, the nature of having a two rows, two rows, three rows, and not that much, there's only six columns over here, there's a limited degree of how you can actually build out or develop or how interesting the central grid can go. Don't get me wrong, there's a lot you can do with it, but that lot you can do with it tends to play out the same way every single time you play. You really do need to rely on the ability tiles to actually keep the game fresh as far as why you would pursue different types of strategies or where the leverage might be one game versus another, but the central the central grid itself is not necessarily interesting enough because of how small it is. It is effectively a six by a six by seven grid with 42 spots and a limited ways you can actually build and develop that grid. I'll say that the fact that you only have three abilities in the game, you only have three abilities when you buy another ability, you have to lock, knock one out, that just gives you a limited way you can actually engage with this giant smorgasbord of abilities. Now don't get me wrong, in our games, I almost always had five to six tiles in a game because I did knock them out, but very often buying a tile just wasn't something I heavily focused on because buying a tile to replace a previous tile represented some degree of inefficiency because I bought something I didn't need as much, and so I tried to maximize how much I can get from various tiles, but that meant that I didn't interact with as many of the tiles as if I had, you know, access to five tiles, or uh, some way of, uh, of, of benefiting from more tiles considering just how many will show up across the course of a game. As far as what I can see others not liking, first of all, the game can be pretty mean. To me, this is a, uh, a feature, not a bug. I like the fact that you can cut people off, you can take the market from them, you are constantly paying attention to what's available and what other players can build and what's on their board. You're trying to out last other players by uh, not placing out your crops before they do, they do. So there's a lot of interaction in the game and a player awareness and all that, uh, but also because of that, there's some degree of meanness. So if you're looking for a peaceful farming game, this is a slightly more cutthroat farming game. Not fully cutthroat, but there's definite interaction and meanness in the game. The other thing I'd say is a lot of the game can come down to mathing out the optimal action. Well, if I plant, plant, harvest, I'll get that. If I plant, buy, harvest, I'll get that. If I buy, harvest, plant, I'll get that. And don't get me wrong, all games will inherently have a degree of trying to math out the optimal move, but I find in Sacred Valley, more so than in other games, I'm literally counting the numbers. I'm not going by intuitive feel as much, but very often I'm like, okay, that will net me seven coins, that will net me six coins, I'll do the thing that nets me seven coins instead. The math and the optimization is so tight that very often those slight nuanced differences are going to affect what decisions you make and why, and that might not be something you enjoy if you just want to go ahead and have fun and charge it out. Uh, this is a game where you can benefit from trying to optimize your actions and counting it all out. As far as final thoughts on Sacred Valley, I overall enjoyed this one, and I wasn't sure whether I would. Reading through the rules, well, not initially. When I first heard about the game, all that, it looked cool, it sounded cool. But then reading through the rules, I was trying to figure out where exactly is this game? You're just basically planting crops onto a very small board. It's not your own board, it's a shared board. So, you know, the larger spots get you more stuff back. That's a fairly basic game. What's the, what's the core premise here? But they managed to do a lot with very little. Small things like limiting your, your warehouse. You can only have three goods, or five if you bought the upgrade. The fact that you can only actually plant things, you have the technology for means you start the game off not actually being able to get in the way of other players, you have to pay for the ability to get in the way of other players. Small things like that, combined with the small board, combined with the unlocking the various levels as you go, all the, the small things together culminate in an actual lot more decision making than I thought there would be given the nature of the game. For me it has a surprising amount of decision optimization relative to what I thought it would have, and I've enjoyed that, that element of the game. I've also enjoyed the variability of the ability tiles that do keep the game fresh in a board that otherwise wise isn't quite as interesting or different as I would like game to game. For me this was as a, this for me this was a pleasant surprise. Overall it's a 3.5 out of 5. I've had fun with it. I've enjoyed it. There's more going on than you might think. It still is a little bit on the lighter side, but with enough decision making that it's it's a lighter plus. It's, a, it's one of those games that gives you a little bit more than you might think at first glance. As far as other game recommendations, uh, this reminded me a lot for some reason of Llama Llama Land from Phil Walker Harding. Gave me similar vibes as far as, I, I don't know why exactly, not just the alpacas or llamas, but like there seemed to, the general feel, there were elements of similarity there. And I'll also say that again, I don't know fully why, but also gave me vibes of Dinner in Paris if you ever played that one. Kind of the nature of building out increasing point scoring landscapes over there gave me similar degree of, of feeling of those game experiences. In any case, and until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I hope you enjoyed this video, and as always, I hope you have a good one.